All right, welcome to Now This Is Podcasting. I'm your host, Connor, and I have my co-host, Jaden, and former guest, Calvin. Thanks for having me back. And we're going to talk about Interstellar. This is going to be added to our like our play, our favorites playlist. Uh, and this is my favorite, my favorite movie of all time. I mean, I have That's like... bold. I have like, I have like maybe close seconds, uh, but this is easily... I think it's, it's still... It's on this like pedestal above them. I love this movie. It has everything I want. It's... Science fiction, which I love. I think if you listen to this podcast at all, you know that I talk about science fiction books nonstop. Uh, it's great performances. It's uh, the greatest score I think I've ever heard. Like I have it on vinyl. I, I love the score to this. Mm. Uh, even kind of the weird kind of stuff that steps outside of the kind of scientific uh, kind of facts they're going for in this. It still works for me. Just everything about this film works for me, so I'm excited to talk about it. And it looks amazing too, which is no surprise. It's done by Christopher Nolan, so yeah. And it's uh, uh, Hoyta Hotema is his cinematographer. He's done a lot of, uh, he's done a couple of Christopher Nolan movies, like he did Tenet and Dunkirk. Yeah, uh, but this one, he, uh, this is winner of best visual effects. It year. was, yeah, yeah, it did. Um, he also did Spectra, the 007 movie. He did, which I was surprised he did her. He did all the cinematography for her. That's uh, the Joaquin Phoenix yeah, phone movie. It's a great movie. Uh, I will yeah. never watch it. Oh, oh it, we got to talk about it. <laughs> okay, well, oh. if we have to. If I have to, then I will. Yeah. There's so I many. No there's so many great to. philosophical questions yeah. brought up by that. Um, that movie is excellent. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like that a lot. I just don't even know if I like Joaquin Phoenix. Anymore. I love Joaquin yeah. Phoenix. He's, I love him in Gladiator. He's just a wonderful, yeah, wonderful person. Yeah, I think that's one of the best acting shows of all time. But let's get to yeah. this movie. But he also did Ad Astra, and I think you can tell like if you've seen that movie. I have not. That's one Brad Pitt. Yeah, he has a similar look. But yeah, yeah, the, the cinematography in this is great. And then Hans Zimmer does the score. Hans Zimmer does like every score for Christopher Nolan, except mm-hmm. Tenet, because he was doing the score for Dune while Tenet was being made. So that's like his only, the only thing he hasn't done for Christopher Nolan is that. So He did he did all three Dark Knights? Yeah, he actually talks about it. It, it was nice to move on for him from, it's basically like they spent years working on all the Batman movies. And so it was really nice to move on from kind of these same sort of themes throughout the three films. Yeah. Uh, you know, musically and to find something totally new to do, which this has a really unique score to me because of how like big the organ is in it. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's like the driving force of the score instead of just like kind of a background piece or it's not used as like a it, it, horror movies use it as like a kind of a, it, an element Obvious, in their films yeah. or you hear it in like these like, like wedding scenes or something like that. But this is like, this is the score. Like the organ is the score and then everything builds on it, which is yeah. great. And did you, did you um, look into uh, how he came up with the score or what he was told the inspiration for right. the score was? Yeah, it's it's really great. So Christopher Nolan basically tells Hans Zimmer, he's like, this is, I don't, he doesn't tell him what the genre of the movie is. He's pretty vague. He, he just tells him this is a movie about a, a father and a son. And so then Hans Zimmer comes up with the piece of music that ends up becoming kind of the base for all the other uh, bits in the score. And it's not till after that that they, he's, he's written this piece and Christopher Nolan hears it and likes it that he tells it it's like, this is like a big epic sci-fi. It actually is more of a story of a, of a father and a daughter. But Hans Zimmer was talking about how he really connected with this and really wanted to make this amazing score because he has a son. And so he, he kind of tried to have that relationship like... So no one lied to him to get the better outcome. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is exactly, I mean, a director is supposed to get the best performances yeah, and the best stuff he, he did can. did his job, yeah. yeah. So it, it, I think it totally works. It's it's really cool. And it, it does. It feels like it's this big, grandiose, like epic um, score. And it feels like emotional. And it's because it came from this like emotional core to start out with. And I think you really feel that. You really hear it throughout the film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the end, I, I could just like wax poetic about this movie. There's just everything about it like... Uh, the performances, I think Matthew McConaughey is this is his best movie I've uh, ever seen him in. I'd say second best, but yeah, that's tough. I don't know if this is. His and best if you're film. thinking Dallas Iron Bars Club, that is not what I'm fucking talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about Surfer Dude. Oh, okay. I'm a big Mud? fan of that movie. Mud is good. Mud was pretty good. But then, I'm talking about Surfer Dude. The movie is tru- called Surfer Dude. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. And then you have True Stars Detective. Stars him and Woody Harrelson. What? Yeah. Oh. Movie's amazing. But yeah, after I saw this, that's when I was like. I looked at 
other stuff he's done, like Lincoln Lawyer and everything like that. I mean, How to the, Lose a Guy in Ten Days. I have watched that. Yeah, <laughs> that's but, a great, great one. Um, yeah, but yeah, like th- this movie has really got me <clears throat> to uh, be more interested in Matthew McConaughey as an actor because he does he does like a lot of rom com type stuff before that, and I was like, eh, I don't care. And Sahara. But, yeah, yeah. What a what? <laughs> that is terrible. That's Why? Why? Yeah. I didn't know that was such a um, a box office failure. That, yeah. that was a big. I mean, that was a big flop. Before this movie, his like three movies before this were probably just like all right, all right, all right. Yeah. Like <laughs> 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 I said, this. I didn't get it for a moment. <laughs> oh, it's <that's> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good joke, dude. Uh, but this cool. this movie is like, uh, you know, when people say like this had me on the edge of my seat, like you know, just your kind of classic like headlines that come up uh, with the with the um, the trailer to get people to go watch it. Yeah. Some critical say it. This is the first movie I was ever like. I literally was on the edge of my seat. There's a, a great, I think the climax as far as like action that takes place is the the docking scene, which we'll get into. I saw this in IMAX in all of its glory all the great mm-hmm. sound and everything and, and that scene's taking place and I'm like I literally I like lean forward it was on the edge of my seat watching this movie. This is this is one of the few movies that if it like does a re-release I will go see it in IMAX. Oh like, yeah. Absolutely. Would, or Dolby. Yeah. Like, I mean because the sound is great in this too. Like, yeah. it's, it's very abrupt. and uh, yeah. yeah. I would love to see this again in theaters because yeah. this this is a movie that lends itself to being on the big screen so well. Like mm-hmm. it, it it doesn't do it justice to like watch it at and, like I, I I saw it at home for the first time. Like I've never seen it in theaters, oh, so yeah. it would be it would be sweet to get yeah. the experience. Oh. oh my gosh! Yeah, have you even lived? Yeah, this. Yeah, like, how I've lived? <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> and I think Christopher Nolan does a great job of this. He 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 does these really bombastic big films that just they lend themselves to being in a theater, which is why I think he, he was such a big holdout on Tenant being released in streaming, and it yeah. had to be in theaters. And it was a total bomb, which I don't think is his fault, and I don't think it's a bad movie. It's just like that's weird. Uh, that's not what I've heard. Oh, I, people, I liked it. A lot of people absolutely hate the mix on it. It's oh, the sound the design, yeah, the the mix for it is terrible. Yeah, it, there's parts it's where too it's too loud. Well, there's parts where it's too loud, and then there's parts where you can't hear any of the dialogue. Like, yeah. It's really crappy. And, and I, and his kind of argument for that is like people are just aren't willing to experiment and try new things. It's like it. I I'm try new things for sure, but make sure I can hear the thing yeah. you're trying. I mean, that's one thing about this movie is like, I mean, people, uh, there's criticism about the score, like from other directors in Hollywood and stuff about Interstellar because it was too loud. And then he just went way overboard in Tenet. Oh yeah. No, I uh, don't mind the score being loud in this. Some, at some points it's a little annoying, but I think like in certain aspects, like the docking scene, like it fits perfect. Oh that. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. Uh, and I think of a lot of his movies, this one has like, has good, relationships and character moments in it i think there's some of his stuff that it's it's just such a big deal and it's just such a spectacle on screen that you kind of lose out on it, it kind of it kind of misses some basic stuff that i think he could do better uh but i think this film I, it's for me like i i buy all the relationships i buy all the interactions i know there's a lot of criticism of Anne hathaway's character in this i i yeah i, I i'm on board with her i think i think it's still good she's she's certainly not the worst yeah i think the worst is yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm done going on about it. I just wanted to give my background. I just love this movie, and yeah. I'm excited to talk about it. With I, you guys. This movie appreciate it. It deserves love as well. It's a good movie. Yeah, yeah. it is wonderful. So it had a uh, budget of 165 million, and Christopher Nolan is one of those like few directors around right now who can get a big budget to basically just do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah, because I mean, he made Batman. Yeah. incredibly successful. Yeah, so. I mean, so you don't see a lot of I think directors get to execute a vision that they really want on an epic budget. There's always like a. I mean, most directors, most directors, no matter the budget, really don't get a lot of uh, creative license in general. Like right. what I've heard from Ad, about Ad Astra is it was a it was a slow moving sci fi movie that got cut up, reshot, and made into something completely different. And people still really like that movie. Yeah, and it's probably like half as good as it originally was. Yeah, and that's and that's the that the that's the really sad part about a lot of of cinema now. But so it is nice when like you know. It's not like Christopher Nolan is the this high, high-minded auteur. He is an auteur to to a degree, but it's more to uh, lends itself to um, entertainment rather than the 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 abs- the actual substance. Yeah, I I tend to agree with that. It, these aren't 
I think he gets confused for being some like high concept director. These really aren't. Yeah, he's he's like he's like he's like the frat boys like high minded director. Yeah, yeah it's like, like this oh, is. Oh still... man, have you seen like the greatest movie ever, Christopher Nolan? What a yeah. what a an amazing director. Everything he makes is like visually stunning yeah. and just. I mean, they're they're great quality pieces of work. He's good at making like a smart blockbuster. It's yeah. still just like yeah. it's still just a blockbuster. Yeah. it's not like it's not a high minded. It's not an art house film. movie. Yeah, yeah. Like that. it, it confuses the casual audience that it is. Yeah, yeah. So everyone thinks they're yeah they're they're watching some some fancy film festival movie yeah. like, like yeah. Midsummer or something like that. It's like this is not even close to like conceptually on the same <laughs> no. level as that yeah. movie is. So. So I, I, I rocket still, ships. Like. Yeah. I still, uh, I still appreciate like his movies for what they are, and oh, I think, yeah, yeah, and I think this is the best one. So yeah, and it made seven hundred and one million dollars. So this is a, a super successful movie. Yeah, I, mean, I would call his second best one, but yeah, it's good. What is his first? What do you uh, think? Two thousand eight, Dark Knight, dude. Okay, that's fair. I mean, not necessarily because of him. I think it's because of Heath Ledger. But yeah, yeah, I think just that the, giving a. A landscape for that kind of performance is. I mean, is as a Marvel dude, and like fans of us, I sure, love every every Marvel everything dude. that Marvel comes out. Like I'm gonna love, even if it's yeah. shitty. Um, the Dark Knight is the best superhero movie ever made. Yeah, no, no Marvel movie has ever come up to the same level. I mean, the like, Dark like Endgame, and Infinity War, different like third spectacles, and like yeah. it's a different aspect, but. As far as like quality movie, nothing's ever been close to that. Yeah, yeah. while still being an amazing spectacle. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's yeah. That's a really good movie. Yeah. It's still not as good as Interstellar to me, but I, it's I agree. good. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fine. This is a very very close second. To yeah, me. yeah. Uh, so I want to split this up. The first kind of section we'll get into is is all the stuff that takes place on Earth from the beginning of the movie to when Cooper decides to leave, and then uh, you get into all the kind of the interview scenes where it's uh, people talking about. You know what it's like to live with the there's no more corn and or there's only corn. It's like the blight happened and mm-hmm. stuff like that. A lot of those interviews are actually from a 2012 PBS uh, documentary, The Dust Bowl. Yeah. yeah, he got permission from Ken Burns to use those. Yep. I remember watching that and thinking, like, what are those people wearing? Like, they should be they should be like 200 years in the future if they're that old, talking about something that's happening now in like 2050. You know, yeah, yeah. I thought that was that was weird, but then to find out that they were found footage, basically, yeah, it's, it's nice, it's cool. It's also interesting thinking about it's the the this current state of the Earth um, as related to another point in history of uh, American history. So that's that's nice. I can get past that part for a little bit of continuity. Mm. Well, I thought it was I thought it was cool when they did it. So I want to know: Do you guys think that the the blight and kind of the dire situation that humanity is in right now. Do you think it's set up well enough? Like, do you, do you buy it? Do you think that they should have a motivation to go to space and then try to find a new planet? Um, so there's a part where they're, uh, when uh, the sun is tested and he, they're saying like, Hey, he's going to be a farmer. Yeah. Um, and then the way that I, so Hey, they do the bullshit of where they're trying to teach kids that, the uh, Apollos are all faked. Yeah, that, that uh, it was which a, is not fucking true. America's been in the moon. Yeah, it was um, like propaganda to bankrupt the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah I love that which, part. Which it's amazing to me that they said like I think it was amazing propaganda to bankrupt the Soviet. Union. The real story is still the same. You don't need prop. They literally did that trying to win the space yeah. race. So. It's not even yeah. necessary to say that it wasn't true. Well, it's just trying to get kids. Yeah. yeah, but it's just trying to get kids to keep their keep their heads out of the clouds. I know, but the same thing. Like they could have been, they could have just told the real history yeah. and gotten the same effect. I thought it was a weird bit of like it is we, weird. We need to, but, we need to make I mean, it like the system. The United States uh, educational system has been known to lie about a few things. I love Colette. But, Colette Wolf is the teacher. In yeah, that scene, so, and I love the look on her face when like. Matthew McConaughey kind of tells her off and she's like in shock like yeah but it but like me as the viewer I'm in shock that she thinks NASA like isn't real like so <laughs> my thing is like the point that she makes is like we should focus on earth here mm-hmm. before we, and like to be fair like that's the way I feel right now okay as far as shit goes like as far as like we need to care for our planet not worry about this oh you're it. absolutely right yeah and uh so that's like that's the only kind of discord I have with it other than that like yeah if there's no fucking food we can't grow any food. Yeah. We got to bail. We don't have a choice. Yeah. I just didn't know if maybe, because I think that was the That's complaints a big, I had heard was like, it's a, this doesn't make any sense. Why are they even going to space? It's like, well, because they're all going to die. Like, yeah. Well, so it's yeah. a big point because um, biologically it wouldn't happen this way when yeah, they're talking is, about like there being not enough oxygen the, for all of the, for 
the type of growth to, to happen would take like a million years. So there are better ways of setting it up. I don't think it's, it's, I don't think this was the, the science that they really wanted to try and keep accurate. They just needed an impetus to, to go to space. Right. So I, agree so with that. I, I don't and necessarily they, care. It's a, it's a movie and it's viable. As yeah. far as any other movie that I've seen. So. Well, so part of the reason why it is so controversial is the inspiration of this film was actually uh, the the birth... Um, I, I don't know what the word is. I don't know why I can't think of it right now. But it's uh, the, the concept came from a theoretical physicist and uh, his friend who was a, a film pro- producer and they were actually introduced by Carl Sagan so I like of this I like to think of this film as as uh the brainchild of uh Carl Sagan oh that's what the word I'm looking that's for brainchild yeah. okay. but so they met Brain and movie. so the their uh their entire thing they wanted to write a, a film um where the purpose was that all of the science would uh in the film would not be like any established laws would not be violated and any speculation would be done by um, would be in uh, any speculative ideas shown in it would be endorsed or um, they would be plausible as it pertains to the scientific community. Like they weren't just going to use someone who made a speculation, but they were, you know, um, reputable scientists who put forth claims that this is possibly how uh, science works. And so the fact that the they kind of just like blight, and just didn't right. really think about all of how it really would work um, is one, why so many people are hung up on this one detail. Yeah. I do like that you bring the science up um, because it is a huge part of this movie and they do try to take it very seriously. Um, so Kip Thorne is kind of like who they had. Who He's a physicist and he was kind of their, <coughs> their go-to. And he basically is like, I won't be a part of this if, if you guys try to deviate too far from like the laws of nature that have kind yeah. of been established. And this is kind of a, a socially or a scientifically accepted theory. It's if you guys deviate too far from that, I won't be on it. He's actually a producer. He's credited as a producer on yeah. the film, which is, I think is super cool. Yeah, yeah, he was on, he was on, he was the one that actually wrote all of the uh, equations on the chalkboards. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, it, that's yeah. that's a very neat. He, yeah. yeah. Nice. So yeah, to me, I thought, yeah, well, it's it, it didn't seem like contrived, and I thought that the blight was explained enough because they talk about, like, first it was this crop that went, and this is the last cr- uh, yield of, like, okra, okra we'll ever yeah. have. Or, and they're all like, you dumbass, you should have grown corn. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I just thought it was, I thought it was set up well. Uh, I bought it right away, and to me, that's what, like, makes the movie so much easier to watch. If you can understand the motivation for why they are doing these explorations to other planets, then it makes the rest of the movie so much more enjoyable. If you can't, if you can't get over like, well, why are they even, why are they even doing this? Then this movie will be tough to watch, I think. Yeah, um, and I think there's a valuable, viable reason why they're doing it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the movie does a good job of making that. Honestly, yeah. it. I don't know if I care that much um, about the reason for it. It could have been anything. We could have been like an, an could asteroid. Could have been like we're fucking bored of eating corn. I'd have been okay with that. Yeah, <sighs> I would have hated if it was an asteroid because then it's you get too many deep impact Armageddon. Vibes. Well, yeah, say yeah. you just fly up there that. and have Ben Affleck and Bruce Willis blow it up. Yeah, yeah that, exactly. That's me makes the movie so much worse. I like that it's a kind of like I said, this movie tricks you into thinking it's a lot smarter than it is because it's like it's not an asteroid; it's blight, and it's yeah. like it's something that's killing all of our food, and like that's the real problem. It's not some like. It's it's not some external body that. So there are no like animals in this movie either, zero. Uh, no, yeah, you don't see it. I don't think you see. see I don't even think you see like birds or a dog. Like, yeah, that's they're on a farm. Like they'd have a dog if they could. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a bummer. Yeah, to me, I think that sets up the, that sets up the situation there. And like they go to the yeah. baseball game and uh, the grandpa, he's like, well, the fucking well, watching the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. I did that in quotations, by the way. But he's like, he's like. <laughs> I want a hot dog. He's like popcorn is unnatural at a at a ball game. <laughs> yeah. So it just sets up like the situation there. Because like, what the fuck is a hot dog? I didn't even right. realize why they would have popcorn there. Like, because I mean, I've that's, eaten popcorn at at a at a baseball game before. But that's crazy. Because I, I I always get a hot dog every time I go to a baseball. Yeah. Game. yeah but it means just like just because everything is corn. Yeah. So that that makes sense now. I just, like, yeah, I just they're eating dinner. It's like it's like corn and then like corn bread. Yeah. So, he he oh, just man. he has he has very like old man get off my lawn vibe. Yeah. Like, that's I don't. Oh, what is the actor's name? John Lithgow. Yeah, uh, through Rock from the Sun. Yes, yeah. Yeah. his Far- name's Donald. I said the grandpa, but his yeah. name's Donald. Yeah. Lord um, Farquaad from Shrek. He does. He <laughs> plays more Far- Farquaad. That's the that's, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> now I you did have to not back. know that. I, I, and that's why I was like, uh, when I saw him in uh, the fourth season of Dexter, I was like, oh my god, Lord Farquaad. He plays his dad, right? 
in Dexter? No, he's a, he's a he's a uh, a serial killer. Is, okay. he the, is he the Trinity killer? Yeah, he's the Trinity yeah, right. killer. Okay. Yeah, that that, just sucks. that's that that no, that season though is amazing. It's mostly sure. because of John Lithgow. Yeah, I that, that. Uh, he's a great actor, so yeah. I wouldn't doubt that. So yeah, exactly. I um, love his voice; just the timbre is so wonderful. He's definitely Lord Farquaad. Like yeah. now that you've said it, yeah, right. Like, <laughs> unsee it. Yeah, I love when he like sends the knights away to go, like they do that competition to see who's going to rescue the princess. Yeah. And he's like, "It's a sec." He's like, "If you die, it's a sacrifice. I'm willing, willing to, to pay." Make. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's such a good line. <laughs> But anyway, and, and then uh, and then constantly imitated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd love to talk about Shrek sometime. Yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> film to talk about. Yeah, I also love the name Murphy for a girl, kind of. Like, yeah, cool. Yeah, I, there's this kind of a cool scene. It's just before the the drone's taken down, and she's like, "Why'd you guys name me after something bad like Murphy's Law?" It's not bad. He's like, "Just because it can't happen, it, you know, it will happen." He's like, "That doesn't mean everything bad is going to happen." Yeah. And it means everything I, good is going to happen, too. Yeah, and he's like, and your mom and I thought we were just okay with that. About like, that, uh, sweet, Murph's sweet. opening line in the movie is, uh, just point this real quick, it's like, I thought you were a ghost, which uh, plays in later into the movie. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah there's like there's like little bits yeah. sprinkled in, and, and I, that's why I think that the ending, while a lot of people have a problem with the ending, I, I have zero issue with the yeah, ending. Oh. I think it totally works. We'll uh, get into the ending, yeah. because I, I, the so end, I read Kip Thorne's book about right. all of the, the phys- like, Physics is actually like my first love. That's what I went to school for before I did film. But I got to the end of, um, I got to triple integrals and in calculus three. And I was like, fuck this. Yeah. No way. <laughs> I don't like, it was like, it like, uh, it was like, inch, it was like find the volume of this bedpost. And it like looked like something out of an MC Escher painting. I was like, what is that? And yeah. there's no. So that's why I'm an artist. Yeah. They, see. <laughs> And it's it's good that you hey, did physics because, is hard, because this isn't a physics podcast, so you'd have no podcast to do if you were a physics major. Yeah, well, I'd have no podcast that anyone would listen to. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to our fifty fans. Yeah. <laughs> so there's I so I read his whole book about like um what he, his speculative take on how a lot of this is going to work, and as well as what is um scientifically uh the the consensus on what's what things would look like and what things are part of the laws so i'll be able to talk uh we'll be able to talk about a lot of it at the end a lot of it is very plausible right so then i want to talk about um murph's talking about the ghost in the bookshelf and i love how it, the way it starts is uh the the lander the lunar lander is broken the little model he has and that's like kind of Murph first talking about the ghost and he's like, ah, you got to take better care of our stuff. And he's like, I'm not concerned with, he's like, you need to use science to, um, explain things. He's like, I'm, I'm not concerned with like your conjecture. He's like, you need to use the scientific method. And it, it, throughout the process, he becomes way more interested in the bookshelf as well. Like it starts out as just kind of like, he's trying to brush Murph off, I think. And then he becomes like really into it. It's like slowly builds into him realizing that this might be this anomaly is something that's important so it's it's some some anomaly with gravity is knocking these books off the shelf and they're trying to Murph's trying to figure out what it means and then when cooper becomes more involved that's when you find out it's like a, a binary code and i think cinematically i love that shot where they've just left the baseball game there's like the dust storm and murph has left the bedroom or the door open to uh the room with the bookshelf and you can see the the way the light and all the dust is it's like the dust is falling in a specific way and it spells out at this like binary code. And that's how they end up finding out. Like they follow those coordinates and they arrive at NASA. I just love the way that shot looks. I think just all the dust falling and yeah, no, the lights coming great. down. Yeah. It is and, beautiful. And then later on, Donald's like, he's like a, he's like a, like dinner's ready or something. He's like, you know, whenever you're done praying to that thing, like, <laughs> yeah. I just think it's a, it's a, it's a cool little line. Cause at that point now, Cooper is like totally involved in this. Yeah. Like he's, he's invested now. And I like just the way it starts. He's like, oh, you're breaking stuff. You're not taking care of your things. I don't care about your ghost. Yeah. And then it becomes like the more they use the scientific method to figure out what it means, the more involved he becomes, which I think is great. And I think it really speaks to the the film wanting to be scientific. Mm-hmm. And also the foreshadowing of the uh, lander getting knocked off and being broken. What do you mean by that? The little model getting broken as it's knocked off, just like it's broken um, by man. And the explosion at the end. Oh, okay. I, mm-hmm. I didn't think about it that way, but that's that, that's a cool bit of yeah. I yeah. guess you're right. That's a cool bit of foreshadowing. I never thought about it that way. That's cool. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So they find the coordinates. They and I, I and I, I. The movie does a good job of I think building the relationship between Murph and Cooper. Uh, they. 
arrive at the coordinates, but it's fenced off. And uh, he's like, I think we've reached the end of the road. She's like, aren't the bolt cutters in the back? He's like, that's my girl. <laughs> <laughs> I love their relationship. And, yeah. and I know a lot of the inspiration for the film came from Christopher Nolan and his brother, uh, Jonathan Nolan, wrote it. And they it was supposed to be like a father-daughter story, but set in this like epic sci-fi setting. And I think that they captured it really well. I I I I buy the relationship between Murph and Cooper. Oh, absolutely, especially when she's the do- like when she's young. Yeah, young Murph is I, is great, and yeah. I, I like all the because the, the, there's three kind of iterations yeah. of her um, throughout the movie, and and I think they all are really well done. And yeah, I, think yeah all... I I could not disagree more. No, oh, okay. I honestly would cut Jessica Chastain entirely. She's I, she's it's it's the worst part of the film, and it. You could cut all of those, all of those scenes, and this film does not change one bit. No, well, I think it still I plays into the linear concept of time that's going on yeah. with that. Yeah, with but you don't older. even, yeah, you don't even need it though, and uh, and we will explain it. Um, later. Yeah, when we get into that section, I, I'd love to talk about it because I just I disagree with you. So, oh yeah, I know. Don't, don't the, worry. Who's, uh, who's the little girl that plays Murph? Uh, Mackenzie Foy. She does a fucking fantastic job. Yeah, yeah. I think she, she yeah. Uh, her play, her acting with Matthew McConaughey, and I'm sure that McConaughey has something to do with that, with boosting her confidence and stuff. Yeah, because McConaughey's a good dude. Well, yeah, and, and right. you get to share the screen with this big, big time actor, yeah, so it's got to be like a uh, okay. I've, I'm, I must be good if I'm, if I'm on screen with this. Yeah, guy. and I'm sure he was just like encouraging her the whole time. Like that's yeah. the way I picture Matthew McConaughey being. And yeah, it's just uh, their relationship together. I feel like even off screen was probably pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, that's actually something that Kip uh, wrote in his book about. Um, Christopher Nolan said that if uh, either Matthew McConaughey or Anne Hathaway had um, questions about the sciencey stuff, that to, to talk to him, and he said that he um, met Matthew McConaughey and they just talked for like two hours. He was like, it was like math and physics and religion and spirituality and politics. He says just like it's just like a wild dude and is so so much fun to talk about and. Uh, he was talking to Linda Opst is the is his friend the producer, and uh, she's like, yeah, I didn't want to spoil it for you. Uh, yeah, he's, he's so much. He's so cool to talk to. No, I imagine he's an excellent dude. Um, so when they they he cuts the the chain on the fence, and that's when you're introduced to um, Tars, which is at th- these get described as robots. Well, wait, that's Tars. Yeah, because later on, he, when he's kind of in that interrogation room, he's like, don't make me take you down again. Man, I had no idea. He tases him and stuff. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, and it's uh, you can tell it's uh, Bill Irwin's doing the voice. And yeah, so it's him at the beginning on the other side of the fence. You just see the flashlight. So yeah. you're sort of introduced to Tars, and I like how they do it because um, you don't you think it, it's probably just a guy. Yeah, with a flashlight and a gun. Like, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah, but then Cooper wakes up, and he's in this interrogation room, and there's this mechanical thing in front of him. And it was done on purpose because Christopher Nolan was like, I don't want a robot in this. A robot is designed to like emulate human behavior. It looks like that's like kind of how they're all these bipedal, this mechanical entity. And they're all designed to kind of act like or work like a human does. And he's like, I don't want that. I wanted something that is like completely practical. Yeah. And uh, he described them as um, actuating machines rather than robots, which I think is an excellent way to put them. Because it's like it's basically the, 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 the same rectangle shape and it's that same shape in a different scale that just keeps opening up yeah to allow for like more uh dexterity or mobility yeah and it, it's really cool the way they put them together because it is just supposed to be something that is practical like it, it's completely functional there's no style to this this machine at all and i love the way they're introduced as uh he's like oh you're not a mar- not a marine anymore he's like there's no armies yeah and I, so i like the idea that like this used to be like some kind of this was a, a part of like a unit or whatever. It it had a, it served a function before. Yeah. And now it's kind of been repurposed for this like new NASA. And it's not like this is just the robot in the movie. It's not like a droid from Star Wars. It's nothing yeah. like that. It's like it's so functional and purpose built. And they've just kind of adapted it. I think there's a lot of kind of nods to like this is everything is adapting. Like that's the world we live in now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love how it though it is a transformer. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's so cool. And they do a lot of cool effects with that where. It's some of it is it's a practical um, like there's a person moving it. Uh, Bill Irwin does the voice and he also is like the movement behind it. It's like a they use like air pressure and pneumatic pumps to yeah. like move it because huh. they decided they want the exterior to be stainless steel. It started out as like an aluminum chassis and it was pretty easy to move. Yeah. But then it becomes it's like almost 200 pounds. So they had to figure out how to like 
uh, pneumatically how to get it to move that way it could function on screen and like oh, someone awesome. could actually move it that first introduction to it is like that's practical like that's on set none of it is cgi and then there's some scenes where the robots have more not robots uh these machines have more robust movements and those are cgi but they still have some kind of something practical on set that way you can visual effects artists can like use the lighting they have some kind of reference which i think makes the visual effect shot so much better when you're not just kind of guessing at it you can see something to compare it to yeah yeah and i do love how this leads into though as like nasa as a shadow agency yeah which is cool like, yeah because yeah, they uh basically underground science yeah because they say that they <laughs> they basically nasa refused to bomb starving people yeah and that's kind of why it gets shut down which like that part was kind of i was like man but to but me i think it's, yeah me, i don't know why nasa would be the one yeah yeah but i but i i like that they point out that they refuse to do it they're like this is a agency that's meant for scientific discovery not uh murder not causing harm to people and again i think that sets up kind of the situation that they're in it's like it it is so bad on earth that they were willing to like we're gonna cut down the population because there's not enough food like they're willing to go that far so i think that adds to the it of, does the, that that part of the story what do you guys think of the the whole NASA scenes in general? I think as far as the pace of this movie, it seems like pretty consistent throughout. I think it moves from beat to beat really well. I thought all the NASA stuff, like it's very quickly explained that like blight is a thing. Blight's killing everything. Blight uses up all the oxygen. Uh, eventually corn won't even be a thing. He's like, uh, the, your daughter's generation will be the... Uh, will be the first to suffocate. Yeah, yeah, yeah first, first last one's to starve, the first one's to suffocate. Yeah, yeah. and so... I think it speeds through that, and then they go like, "How did you find this place? Like, you need to be very specific with us." And yeah. it's like, "Oh, it's the anomaly or whatever." And I think they speed through those scenes really quickly. Uh, that to me is like the only part of the pacing of this movie that I was like, oh. "I mean, yeah. either either linger on it and explain it better, or skip the stuff because we already talked about blight, so you don't yeah. really need to go into it more." It's yeah, it's already in the it's already in the the rules of the science of the film. Like we understand what's going on and why um, NASA would be doing the things he's doing. Yeah. yeah, there's one because you're introduced to uh, Professor Bran, and that, and, and Cooper knows him because he used to be a pilot for NASA, and so they know each other. And there's a scene where they, they're like in a boardroom, it looks like, kind of discussing stuff, and then all of a sudden he's like, "Did you notice the shape of the structure? It's a centrifuge or whatever." And then it like cuts to them like outside of the boardroom, and then it cuts them back into the boardroom where they continue discussing like the Lazarus missions and stuff like that. Yeah, I think the editing there is is wonky. I think it, if I have to knock any part of the movie, like this is it. I think it's I think it's too fast. It, it's either too fast, or with it's a lot of exposition. Badly. Yeah, this, I mean, it's a pretty typical Christopher Nolan thing with a, an immense amount of exposition. So it's not really necessary. There's there's enough that we can kind of we can kind of get. You know, we yeah. kind of understand. And there's one point that I read on the internet, um, which I I don't agree with this, but uh, some fan theories were like, like, why wouldn't Matthew McConaughey's character already be a part of NASA? Again, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but yeah, I guess the if world's you're, fucked up. I mean, things happen. So they say that they first noticed the anomalies fifty years ago, forty-eight. Yeah, forty-eight. But yeah, same difference. Did you? Did we even watch the same movie? <laughs> oh my god! I was I was ballparking. It's fine. Um, uh, ballpark. There's two baseball scenes in this movie. So, so yeah, I, I I kind of agree with that. So if they knew this anomaly existed and they knew that they were going to do these missions and they need a pilot for it, they knew. I mean, before I, I mean before Matthew McConaughey is even born. Yeah, they know about this anomaly and then they find out there's the the, the wormhole out by Saturn, and so like they would they would know that they need a pilot. So yeah. why wouldn't they? And well, I, wonder, I don't know when they knew that the blight was going to be something that would kill them within their lifetime. Okay, that's fair. And I don't know if they knew when. The, that the wormhole was a wormhole at what point they figured that out because that's the there's a lot of physics that we don't know yet we haven't actually been able to observe it's an anomaly but we don't know we don't know what it would what it would look like in real life how we would actually um be able to te detect it and uh, observe it so that's the other thing it's like this it might actually like i suppose it would have had to been quick though, because the the Lazarus missions were ten years ago, so that's thirty eight years after discovery. So you're talking about probably halfway uh, the midpoint between first discovery of anomaly and current day. And like, how long ago was Matthew McConaughey changed from a pilot to a farmer? Yeah. So I I I actually agree with that idea. It's like if this was going to be a mission they were going to go on, and they even say like, "Oh, Cooper, you're our best pilot." 
call your best pilot to be a part of this. What? Like, yeah, they they did say that he thought he was dead, but I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's again. Uh, I think there's a lot of stuff in this movie that tricks you into thinking it's smart, but this is a part of the movie that is not smart at all. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 funny because it there is a lot of high minded. Um, science you know it's true to the science but it's also a little a lot of melodrama that's added into um uh to make it like a a science sciencey science sci-fi epic yeah this is kind of sciencey science <laughs> yeah <laughs> I like that. um so basically like they can't tell cooper anymore about these missions until he agrees to be a part of it and which is weird because like why who cares I think it's there's not a lot of time spent on him deciding he's going to do it. They're just basically like, you, you need to join or we're not going to tell you anymore. He obviously is going to join because the plot needs to move forward. Right. And so you you need to know what these missions are. And the Lazarus missions are basically they're sending astronauts through this wormhole uh, to potentially habitable planets on the other side in a different uh, solar system. And they, they have one final expedition that's going to basically has the chance to uh, through plan B is like uh, they're going to repopulate by using surrogates and like donor eggs and stuff like that. And plan A is they're going to, Professor Brand's going to figure out the equation to gravity to basically harness it to make massive ships that can move. Yeah. Yeah. So when we move past that, he's agreed to go. And I think you get a really good scene with like him and Murph where he's, Cooper's going to explain to Murph that he's, he's leaving. He's going to go on this mission. And uh, it, it, I I think it's set up well. I think this movie has a lot of set up payoff moments and I love that in movies. I hate it when you set up stuff and there's no conclusion to it. And so they set up the watch in a really good scene where he's basically explaining how relativity works and time is going to move differently for Cooper than it is for Murph. And he's talking about like, they'll when he comes back, they'll compare um, the watches and he's yeah. like, I might be the same age as you. And she's like, I, what the fuck you even know when you're coming back? I think that sets up her character when time skips forward and she's an adult to kind of like she has this anger and this animosity towards him and also being um intelligent you know yeah. the mm-hmm. fact that that she picked up really quickly that um you know obviously he'd be gone for a while but the the fact that uh she put she took it to the next le- the next step of uh uh thinking about the difference in age of them right now was, right yeah i i just think it it sets her up because then she ends up becoming a scientist and works for NASA too. Donald has a, has a great scene with... Uh, with Michael Caine. Yeah, with Michael Caine. And uh, he's like, oh, maybe I should... Michael Caine's like, maybe I should stoke the flame of, of you know, because she's smart and she's intrigued by this. And Donald's like, oh, he's sorry. She's already running circles around her teachers. Maybe Making fools out of her yeah, teachers. She can make a fool out of make you. Make a fool too. out of you. So yeah. I, I love Donald in this. Like, he's so protective and he thinks so highly of Murph. I just want to know, like... Uh, I think you, Jane, had mentioned earlier, her acting is so good, the young Murph, um, Mackenzie Foy. Yeah. I think she's great in that scene. Absolutely. I think she's great in every scene she's in in right. this movie. Don't then, make me do this, Murph. Don't make me yeah. do leave like this. Like, that yeah. is, because he knows he has to do it. Yeah. And, like, he, the one person's heart he doesn't want to break is hers. Yeah. Because I think Donald and uh, his son, um, played by Timothy Charlemagne. Uh, Timmy. Charlemagne, uh, Tom. They, uh, they seem to understand, like, they get why he's going. Murph is younger she just sees it as like being abandoned. Yeah. And so her, his good Cooper's goodbye with Murph is like much more emotional. And, and I think they do. It's just like, they're just acting their hearts out on the scene in that scene. I think they're both really good in it. I agree with you so much. And like when she uh, realizes it's like the more scrolls says stay, it's a stay. And yeah. I love uh, Matthew McConaughey when he's like, I love you forever. That's like mm-hmm. one of my favorite scenes in the movie. I mean, th- it's one of my favorite bits of dialogue and I I love the way it's delivered. Yeah, I that part sticks out to me. That one line sticks out to me in this film. Mm. I also love uh Cooper's he checks under the blanket yeah. in the front seat of his car cuz Murph snuck into the car with him earlier when, when she's he's going to NASA. Yeah. Yeah. And he checks the blanket again. I was like, "Oh, my heart." Yeah. It yeah, got me. Right. I like there's all started like hope crying that right she there. was there. Yeah. Well, he did start crying. Yeah. So and uh, after that, he gets on the shuttle and they launch. And so that's kind of the... the Which I was very happy they just skipped right to that too as well. Because I don't need more exposition explaining how they're launching or like when that's all going on. Or like them just like suiting to, up and yeah. like, uh, like uh, mission controls. They're like Which counting it down. Which happens in every single stuff. space travel movie. Yeah. Especially so especially in American film because it's like a celebration of, oh, for sure. of, of our history. And, this, and I think what the film does nicely here is it's really not about countries. It's about... Um, 
it's about existence it's about sentience in general you know it's it's what we we it's it's legacies and choices and 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 human connection in general so to move beyond that i think is is the point and why it cuts over all of the the stuff that leads up to getting on the shuttle you have a really heart-wrenching um uh crossfade of um of emotion you know from from her crying him crying in the trunk uh in the truck to uh him taking off you know it's all it's meant to be be felt simultaneously yep Yep. which is i like that you bring up that it's supposed to be it's kind of it's not about countries it's about Humanity. It's about humanity. It's about it's about how do we how do we overcome this and and so that's why I I actually I thought it was weird that they have American patches on their spacesuits and then whenever they arrive at these camps that are set up on the other planets they are traveling to, they all have a like the a Amer- Lasser mission flag and, and the a the U.S. Flag. flag. Yeah. So I, that's actually a part I I don't super like because it shouldn't be. It's it not, shouldn't be. It's not the way the ISS is set up. We have so many talented a- astronauts from other countries. You'd imagine that, you know, I, I guess we don't really know the state of the world, that really everyone is American. Um, that's that's a possibility. Yeah, America might just bomb everyone else so we would starve. Yeah. yeah, so that's <laughs> that's a really a really disturbing way of thinking about, <laughs> about that's, the way this film works. That's not how I choose to interpret Interstellar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, there's too much too much love and hope and uh, and things to think yeah. that like we should have, we only sport you see is baseball. Just saying. Yeah, not watching soccer or cricket. But I do think it's interesting that you bring it up because it because it I is something I noticed. I thought it was odd that they had American flag on like on their on their gear and stuff like that because it, it seems like it's not a, it's not a story about the u.s succeeding to to save humanity it's about everyone coming together to try and save humanity so yeah yeah it might just be a language thing to be for more mass appeal if we have everybody yeah. with uh that we're not focused on uh other countries and accents and uh, the michael kane's not american going. either so yeah i do love how he and amelia don't even have the same, a- same <laughs> accent <laughs> Right. It's just like, why? <laughs> <laughs> that irritates me so much because obviously, I mean, we we talk about how much I love accents and etymology and that types of those types of things. So to have her have like a very, very standard American accent, and then um, I'm not sure what Michael Caine's accent is. Yeah. It's not close. Speaking more on Dr. Brand, I like how because she's introduced when they arrive at NASA and. Uh, it's it sets up the way her and Cooper are going to interact for a lot of the movie because they they aren't close at all, and uh, Cooper's trying to figure out where Murph is because he's in that interrogation room. And Doctor Brand shows up and uh, she's like, "Oh, she's fine. She's like, must have had a had a very smart mother." Kind of dogging on Cooper for yeah. being like kind of brash and you know busting in there and everything. So I I like how they're set up because I think that that carries on through the film and then they end up becoming closer and I think it's earned because it starts out with them being at odds. Yeah. I'm um, not super huge fan of Anne Hathaway in this movie, but... That's the big criticism is it, her performance, I think for a lot of people, didn't land. For me, I, I it lands, but... Yeah. Yeah. I'm usually a huge Anne Hathaway fan, yeah. so... Yeah, my first it's time watching it, I actually felt the same way, but on the second time, I think she is a really a really good character she she acts and her acting is really good um that that first scene i mean we talked about this uh i think last year um when we were comparing favorite films you and i connor um about how right. that that was kind of melodramatic about the the love thing i mean and i think it still is but it is by far not um not that bad in compared to everything with jessica chastain the reason that yeah, I didn't notice it the first time. It's because the score carries all of the dialogue and all of the pretentiousness of those scenes. It, it completely, it completely takes over, and you don't see that it's all really melodramatic. Right, right, for it's sure. So goofy. Yeah, we'll get into that more when we get into that section. Do you guys have more comments on kind of what takes place on Earth? Uh, just real quick, I know that Christopher Nolan grew five hundred acres of corn yeah. for this movie. Yeah, he did. That's so crazy. It is fucking insane yeah it, it, it there's really cool shots of the truck driving through all the corn and it basically they had like just these big booms set up on the back of other trucks to capture these scenes these like aerial sort of shots yeah it's that all that kind of kind of chase to get the uh the drone is i think it's done so well and it's it's it, it is so like impactful and like you feel like you're in the truck just like the corn thumping against the truck as they yeah. drive over the sound design is great yeah I, it feels like we're flying with yeah. it too because of the score yep definitely yeah and it's funny thinking we were talking about how much these cameras cost just thinking about 
ah, you know, a, a $250,000 camera at the end of a stick driving around 30 miles an hour. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So the camera itself was $50,000, and then you can't even film. That's just the body of the camera. In order to film it, you need all the components that go along with it, and that's another 50000 And I was reading uh, they were insured for $500,000 on set. Christopher Nolan, I think they broke three of them over the course of the Dark Knight trilogy. I was also reading that if you just want to rent one for a day. So the fact that the whole film is, is, is done on these cameras is kind of amazing to me. And again, that's just kind of Christopher Nolan's clout. Like he can just do whatever he wants, I guess. Yeah, it's amazing that the budget was actually only $165 million. Yeah, right. <laughs> despite that. Because, and, I mean, it's not like they, like uh, uh, when, we, when they talk about rendering the, uh, the, digi- the digital effects, there were certain frames for the black hole that uh, took 100 hours to render. Yeah. 800 terabytes of data. Un- unreal. The, the, that, that. This film was only $165 million. Which seems like that's an expensive movie. But it is, it, comparing to what you're seeing on screen, it's like, how is it this cheap? And there's also, there's so many practical sets built. So this doesn't, this does have a lot of visual yeah. effects that's done really well. It also has so much practical stuff, which that costs a lot of money too. Like I love the the ships there in the Ranger. The, the seats are like on a swivel. So as the ship turns, like they will stay stationary and like all the components move with them. Um that's a practical set. Like, yeah. And what they did, they, they actually had like a projector with the star field projected on it and it would move along with the scene. So even the stuff you're seeing through the window is, is real. It's there. It's not, sure it's not, wasn't even a, a green screen though. I think for maybe for some of it, I know for, there are certain parts where he wanted them to feel like they were in space or they were like approaching the planet. And so it's projected out. So it, it's like the actors were seeing it. I don't know. Maybe it's um maybe in post they, they do edit it and they do it digitally because it would look better. But I know when it's filmed, they have these projectors set up that way. It looked like they were in space. And I think that helps too, because then it makes the lighting accurate. Yeah. Because then it's like... you. It, I mean, it's just it's just harder to go back and make it re- realistic lighting. Right. That's, that's all. But yeah, I love the, all of those things being practical. They were miniatures, but they really called them max maxatures because the yeah. things were like, they were like an eighth the size of, of the, uh, of the real thing. Right. So they're massive. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not something that you can put on a table and call a miniature. Right. Uh, I love the phrase that, uh, Peter Jackson uses for, uh, like the set, the miniature for Helm's Deep. There's one, it's like a, it's like a quarter scale of Helm's Deep. It's humongous. Oh my gosh. And they, he, and then there's like the, uh, the towered Isengard is, uh, there's a miniature of that, but he, he, he calls them bigatures, which I think is, <laughs> it's just a great term. That is great. It really, it really flows off the tongue. Yeah. Better than maxatures. Yeah. I wasn't going to call you out on it, but it's. Uh, well, that's what they called it. <laughs> is that what they used? Yeah. That's, oh, that's, that was yeah. A, like, I'm not wrong, Connor. Like, <laughs> I thought that was a, I thought wrong. that was a Calvin original. Oh no. Yeah. No, that was what they on the set referred to them as. A, huh. But I love too, because they made them that way of how, how they placed the camera. Like they placed the cameras on the side of, uh, Coop's truck, um, showing him go behind, uh, as he's driving away from the house. They have so many cameras set up on the side of the, of the ship so you can see out to space. But I love it, that. It just feels like you're actually, it's not like, it's not this big dramatized, like, theater type thing instead like it's a lot of like this is what's happening this is what they'd be you know these are the types of things they'd be able to see um if they were actually in space you know those types of perspectives to make you really feel like you're there i think the idea behind it was they having the cameras like kind of attached like the hull of the ship or or right outside is is this is probably a camera feed that you would see on like the iss like they would have an external camera and this is what you'd be looking at to monitor things and right yeah, like it's a pragmatic setup rather than something for style for film. You right, know? exactly. And I think that that kind of adds to, like we said, this has such a scientific foundation and it's supposed to be taken seriously. It's supposed to be like real. And so the way that the cameras are set up add to that, I think. Mm-hmm. Do you guys have anything else to add to kind of the section that takes place on Earth before Cooper leaves? No, I'm ready to ready yeah. to move on, honestly. Yeah, let's, I mean, uh, let's go into space here. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the Earth stuff is meh to me. Okay. I think the whole thing could happen in space. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of the Earth stuff. I think it needs to be in the movie. I, I like how it, I think it sets everything up well. Yeah, I don't think it, without it, I don't think it. Uh, the rest of the movie isn't, but the the risk is represented as well if we don't have the aspect of the Earth. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it sets up. I understand. Yeah, like I said, I think it sets the motivation up really well. Um, yeah. So, and that's why I think I splitting into like these kind of three acts because they all seem to have a kind of a distinctly different feel. All right, so that uh, bit went a little bit uh, longer than we expected, so we're going to split this one up into three different episodes, uh, covering the three different acts that we mentioned before, kind of all the stuff that we just went over in part one, 
kind of covering everything on Earth before Coop leaves. Uh, part two is going to cover most of our action that takes place in space. And then part three is going to kind of dive into uh, what happens inside the black hole and the conclusion of the whole story. So I hope you guys enjoyed part one. Please join us for uh, part two and part three. And uh, thanks again for listening to Now This Is Podcasting.